Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to me to be here with you all uh, to share with you this case that I'm going to present. I have no conflict of interest. So I'm going to present uh, this patient in early 50s with a background of uh, some medical conditions, including hypertension, COPD, diverticulitis, depression, and an anxiety. The patient is an ex-smoker, independent normally, but manages 200 meter on flat. Medications include antihypertensive medication, philodipine, and some inhalers, as well as some medications for the underlying mental health condition. So this patient presented with one week history of abdominal pain, worsening long-standing productive cough of yellow sputum, generally unwell, but reported no fever, no other significant abdominal symptoms, no, res no other uh, respiratory symptoms, and no cardiovascular or urinary symptoms. On clinical assessment, the patient was tachypnic with a respiratory rate of 36, apyrexial, hemodynamically stable with a heart rate of 100 beats per minute and sinus rhythm. GCS was 15. And on ABGs, hypoxis, hypoxic and uh, PCO2 with a normal. He was in type two, in type one, sorry, type one respiratory failure with a saturation of 88%, requiring 15 liters to maintain oxygen saturation 90%. On examination of the uh, chest, there was a widespread, widespread crackles bilaterally with no wheezes, cardiovascular and abdominal examination were normal. So the next step this patient had is some workup and this is the ECG of this patient. So, okay, thank you very much, Linda. I'll just stop you there for a moment. So, um, would you, would somebody be able to have to comment on the ECG? Anybody out from the panel? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Dr. Dr. Yeah, good morning. It's Mohana Degrad here from Freeman Hospital in Newcastle. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for a nice program and. Uh, for this uh, case, um, I'm looking at the ECG and all what I could see. I mean, there's no acute changes, obviously. Um, you could say there's a poor R wave progression, but that's not unusual in somebody with COPD and a, a presentation like this. So there's nothing exciting on the ECG. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hint, can you carry on? Right, okay. So the blood test was uh, remarkable of uh, lymphocyte lymphopenia. Uh, with a lymphocyte count of 0.69 and on a repeat blood, it was 0.38, CRP was elevated. UNEs, liver function tests, and myelase were normal. The patient had viral screen and it came positive for COVID-19. Now this is the X-ray of this patient. Shall I carry on or anyone would like to comment or shall I just comment on, um, I'll comment first in this uh, x-ray and then if any one of the speaker would like to add any uh, other uh, comment. So this x-ray as we can see shows bilateral opacification, probably mainly on uh, the lower zones and consistent with infection rather than congestion. Shall I carry on? Yes, oh, yes. Yeah. This is the CT chest as part of uh, also workup for this patient. He was complaining of abdominal pain. He had, or the patient had a CT chest of the pelvis. So as we can see here, there is bilateral opacification and ground glass uh, appearance in both lungs consistent with 
COVID pneumonitis. This is just the abdominal CT with no significant abnormality and no evidence of perforation or acute diverticulitis. So this is just the uh, CT uh, chest abdu pelvis report that I've just mentioned. So this patient was seen by the ITU team and admitted to HDU. It was started in CPAP initially and uh, it was maintaining saturation 93%. He developed temperature while staying in the HDU. He spiked temperature 38.5 and started on antibiotics on the base of high procalcitonin. He was also tried on Venturi face mask, was maintaining saturation 60 to 40 percent um, to maintain a saturation more than 88 percent. And the patient was desaturating to 82 percent when off oxygen. Then the patient was transferred on the third day of admission to the respiratory ward. Clinically slightly improving, but remained on a high oxygen, 60%, and short of breath whenever of oxygen. Lymphopenia improved to 0.96, but is still lymphopenic. CRP was still high between 100 to 109. UNEs were stable. On day four, he was randomized to recover a study and uh, he was randomized actually to dexamethasone arm. Just a brief, uh, a brief idea about recovery study. So as we all know that currently we have several proposed uh, treatment for COVID-19, but none of them have uh, a proven efficacy. And the aim of this trial is, or this study, is a, a study um, uh, conducted in UK. Uh, the aim of this study to provide reliable evidence on the efficacy of those several therapies uh, um, available uh, at the moment. And the uh, inclusion uh, criteria is, uh, of course, all patients about 18, uh, 18 and above, and uh, with confirmed uh, COVID-19 by test or radiology or even on clinical suspicion. The patient will be uh, randomized to five arms and uh, if interferon uh, beta is available that could be an another arm uh, as we know that this uh, treatment is uh, quite expensive and is not available in every center uh, or in every hospital. So if the patient gave consent for this uh, study, they will be randomized onto, uh, into five arms. Uh, the first arm will be the, to uh, the no additional treatment or the standard treatment. Uh, other arms include the combination of lupinavir and ritinavir, uh, the antiviral used for HIV. Other arm uh, is uh, the arm of low dose dexamethasone, the arm of hydroxychloroquine and adithromycin arm. And as I mentioned earlier, interferon whenever available. The outcomes uh, of this uh, study would be the on ho in hospital death, the time from illness, the onset to discharge, the need for mechanical ventilation and the endpoint outcome will be at 28 days after admission. So this is an ongoing study at the moment. Okay, so, so um, I'm just going to stop you there, uh, Hind. If you can just go back a moment, a couple of slides. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering whether we could get a comment from uh, Dr. Yusri or, or someone in the panel regarding this presentation. Is this, is this a sort of a, a typical presentation you'd say uh, for COVID? Uh, <clears throat> I would like to comment, uh, Ahmed, that it looks like a typical presentation of COVID. Can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you, uh, Dr. Yes. Babe. Thank you. Yes, so it is a typical presentation of COVID with the uh, radiological findings and the clinical presentation. 
the only question uh, or information I need to know that at what point uh, in the patient's journey we would be including them into the trial? Because if you look at this patient, we have seen this patient, he is getting better. Uh, and now we are talking about putting him in the trial. Uh, the question will be the trials, uh, whether the patient should be put into the trial right at the start or at the point where they are in the ITU settings or when they are coming off the ITU settings, because that will determine how effi uh, efficacious the medications are at the time of the infection rather than just the tail end of the infection. Thank you, Dr. Bay. That's a, that's a very good question. Can, can I just add a, a comment here, if possible? Yes, of yes. course. Yeah. Yes, sir. I mean, I'm looking at this, this story and the presentation, and if one is in, in the, a different time, a different era, we probably he would not be suspecting COVID from the start. He had no cough because we know cough was about 70%, temperature about 68%. GI symptoms were in the, in the low 30s in terms of presentation with COVID. Um, so in a way, that probably would have been treated a little differently. However, with the presence in the lymphopenia and the temperature, of course, the chest X-ray and the CT scan confirm the diagnosis. So this is a different, uh, different uh, uh, treatment, different approach. But in general, in, in a different era, this probably would not be have been thought of as as COVID, because uh, what we are seeing basically shortness of breath and cough and temperature are the highest or the commonest symptoms um, in these cases. Um, and I think the, the question that's been raised about when do you start and when do you include them? Because we know that they are, the, the way they go off is absolutely phenomenal. They'll be w good in one minute and the second minute they are um, really deteriorating quick. And so inclusion in the study is quite critical when and how. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Taha, would you like to join? Hi, hi, good morning. Um, yes, um, I mean, we knew from the outset that the like the disease manifestations of COVID-19 um, is first systemic, number two, it was broad spectrum and protein. Um, but, you know, it's quite fascinating how our knowledge of um, the spectrum of disease has evolved in the last uh, couple of months. Um, and I'm pleased that you have chosen, selected this case for presentation today, because some people may um, think of it as atypical, being presenting mainly with an abdominal pain and no fever. Um, or because of relatively, um, you know, younger age. But I can tell you from daily experience um, that it is now the uh, kind of uh, the most, you know, common of, of presentations um, in in, in um, and accident emergencies. So, um, uh, you know, specifically, you know, the, the CT scan that was done, um, we have quite a few patients who came with abdominal pain and we had you know, suspected um, things completely different, not even cough like this chap. Um, when we incidentally um, found the, um, you know, features of COVID-19 on CT scan. So this is, as the Beck said, this is this is almost like a new norm for um, presentation of um, COVID-19. Great, thank you very much. So, um, uh, Dr. Hind, would you be able to uh, continue? I just a comment, this patient had cough, but it was a worsening uh, cough of a chronic uh, a cough that he usually, uh, or this patient was usually suffering from. So, um, so the patient had worsening cough, no fever at the beginning of presentation. He developed fever while he was in the ward. Okay, okay. so on day five, following admission in the respiratory ward. This patient became unwell, and that was after returning from a bathroom without uh, oxygen. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Hintz. I'm just gonna stop you there again. So this is just to set the scene to everyone. So this is a patient who had a brief stay in intensive care, uh, positive for COVID, um, is improving and is on the ward. The ward is a respiratory ward, and he is going in the bathroom, and as he's coming back, um, he then has a cardiac arrest. Um, now, there's a lot of issues here. What would you do in this scenario? What's the best, you know, the best way to manage such a patient who has a cardiac arrest? I would like to comment, uh, Ahmed. Uh, yes. 
there are a couple of issues. One, how you <clears throat> manage the cardiac arrest. I don't think that will be different in terms of technicalities. Uh, but the question will be how you're going to train and support the cardiac arrest team uh, with the protective measures coming in. Uh, because we can see that this patient is COVID positive, uh, maybe a bit better on day five. So you can question whether he is still infective or not. But having been on the ITU and coming down, I would still class it as infective. And if somebody has a PA arrest, I think a resuscitation council guidelines are there that it is aerosol generating uh, procedure if you do the CPR, although PHE would have a difference of opinion. Uh, but I think, to, uh, from my point of view, PA arrest will be treated as you would treat any cardiac arrest uh, on the protocols, but you will have a very low threshold of involving the ITU uh, if the patient survives. Great, thank you. And at the same Dave. time, providing the protection to the cardiac arrest team. Thank you very much, Dr. Baig. That's an, uh, so that's an excellent point that you made regarding the risks with uh, managing a cardiac arrest, the aerosol generating procedure. And at this point, Dr. Hint has, a, has, a, has some slides from uh, the Rhesus Council about how to manage such an arrest. So I'll pass it over to Dr. Hind. So as we all know uh, that uh, with uh, this COVID pandemic, um, there has been some changes to the, uh, the way that we deal with our patients particularly in uh, the circumstances of cardiac arrest. And, uh, the, uh, and this uh, COVID uh, um, pandemic uh, has resulted in some several important changes uh, to the adult uh, in hospital life support algorithm. And recently it was updated and released by the Resuscitation Council UK. Uh, I think it was 26th of March. Uh, 2020. And uh, the main emphasis, as we can see, this is the algorithm uh, for um, uh, adult advanced life support for COVID patients uh, by the uh, Rhesus uh, Council UK. I've just uh, divided it to um, sections for clarification. So the uh, most important, one of the most important um, uh, aspect uh, on and the new changes is the uh, the um, decision about resuscitation for those patients. So early decision regarding the treatment escalation and not for resuscitation need to be uh, decided and made early by the team and communicated to the rest of the team. Uh, so as we can see here, um, the conversation and decision on the emergency treatment completed and documented for any patient with COVID. So if I go to the next um, slide, uh, the other important also uh, change is uh, with regard to chest compression. And as uh, mentioned earlier, the chest compression is considered an, a, a highly aerosol generating. And as a consequence, um, a full uh, personal protective equipment must be worn and must be used uh, by every individual in, uh, involved in the resuscitation. And uh, uh, the chest compression should not be commenced uh, before uh, wearing the full protective uh, um, equipment. And uh, the other aspect is uh, the uh, allowance now for a delivery of uh, three uh, stacked shocks for uh, a shockable rhythm. So these are the main uh, changes in the algorithm of um, the adult in hospital life support uh, algorithm. This is just a part of the algorithm uh, which shows the, um, uh, the recommendation of the personal equipment. Um, and you have a, a nice video, I understand. Uh, yes. Dr. Hind, is that yeah, correct? so this is the algorithm, full algorithm uh, I've just talked about. Now we have a, uh, a video, or I have a video now uh, uh, for, uh, it was done by the Imperial College London. Uh, I'm going to show a part of this video, just the part that shows the, uh, 
beginning of the how the arrest. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Henry. John, can you hear me? Ask all John, the... John, can you hear me? Have some help, please. So, can you hear the the uh, video? Yes, 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 we can hear. So, as you can see here, John. Responder. He's in cardiac arrest. Put out an adult COVID cardiac arrest. Two, 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 two. The first responder. The the and we can see here this uh, member of the staff is, has not initiated any chest compression, and this is very important. Analyzing the heart rhythm. Do not touch the patient. Shock advised. Stay clear of patients. Deliver shock now. Shock delivered. Call. If needed, begin CPR. The, uh, uh, that member of the staff did not initiate any uh, chest compression because he was not wearing any uh, And as we could see uh, as well, connected, the patient was connected to the defibrillator and uh, as recommended uh, uh, by the uh, Research Council, if there's an indication for shock patient Good. Good. Yeah. Hi. I don't quite aggressive. See the single shock. I'm going to leave then start chest compressions. So, and the oxygen, the other point that the oxygen, uh, there's no need to remove the mask from the patient and just uh, only turn on and off uh, the oxygen without uh, uh, attempting to uh, remove the mask uh, uh, every now and then, just to minimize the. This is one of the recess members. Uh, as we can see, started the chest compression. We'll be with you. So the rest of the team, and no one will get into the room before wearing the full equipment. And uh, for uh, to make it easier for the whole team, it would be recommended or it would be advisable to uh, write the names of the members when they wear the gown. If you can see um, one of the members write the names of each member on the to make the identification easier. These are the equipment, so we can see the gloves, the uh, filtered uh, mask. So all the members now getting ready to get into the room. And it's advisable that uh, only maximum four individuals in the room. Uh, including uh, in the anesthetist and uh, a nurse and a doctor and uh, maybe a, a keeper outside the room. Take over, don't worry. Okay. Okay. Right, I'm just double check you. Yeah, you're good to go. Okay, okay let's go in. Right. So that's at the end of the video. John, can you hear me? Okay, thank you very very much, Dr. Hind. Um, so it's a very interesting video there. Uh, you can see everything was done in a very controlled and calm manner, which is not the way that we normally run cardiac arrests. Um, the other thing I noticed was nobody was really managing the airway side of things. And again, does anyone in the panel like to comment on, on, on that uh, video? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, what you could see for me is very important to make sure that the staff and the team are very well protected. 
Um, Jim, as you said, we usually run the, the cardiac arrest in a completely different way because time of essence, the longer the patient is out of cardiac output or in, uh, in shock of rhythm or PEA, the less likelihood they are going to come back. But of course, with the, in the presence of COVID and the presence of coronavirus, you have to be very careful. So protection is paramount and you really have to be very well protected, level three, because this is a very uh, aerosol generating uh, procedure. So you take your time and you, you uh, cover yourself as well as all the, the member of the team, then you start the, the CPR. The video is very helpful. You could deliver the shock, obviously, because that's not gonna cause much problem, but no CPR without um, full protection. And that's very important. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, thank you so much. That's really, really useful. Um, what do you think of the position of the Public Health England here, thinking of um, chest compression as not a, an aerosol generating procedure and that it can be started meanwhile um, other member staff who are going to be taking care of the airway are getting um, their TPEs on? Um, this has been really quite controversial. I think they started from the wrong premise. It was absolutely and utterly unacceptable the way they, the fact that they've changed the recommendation on multiple occasions tells you where this is coming from. They started them from the wrong premise in the way that because the equipment was not available all the time, so they were trying to fit the, the guideline into the what's available. And I think that's the wrong thing to do. We all knew that um, uh, COVID-19, if somebody with that disease, it is aerosol generating. Because the first thing, if the patient recovers or when you're doing the CPR, you're generating air coming out of the mouth and the airways, and that is, um, that is infectious no matter what. Um, I'm glad the, the Resuscitation Council as well as the Royal Colleges have contra contradicted this and they recommended a full protection and this is what everybody is doing. So I think this, uh, the recommendation of Public Health England, and that has generated a lot of comment and a lot of negative comments in fact, and I did my, the self, myself write, onto, onto them, uh, write to them and also uh, on Twitter and all this um, communication channels to say this is totally unacceptable. The team has to be protected 100%. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mohamed. So uh, yes, you're absolutely right. And the British Cardiovascular Society, the British Cardiac Intervention Society, um, and the British Heart Rhythm Society produced a document uh, in support of the Rhesus Council's mm -hmm. position on CPR being an aerosol generating procedure and that, that uh, Anyone in, who is in the cardiac cath lab or cath, cath, uh, cardiac procedures, they should be wearing full BPE protection. Absolutely, and yeah. I think it's it's um, it does take self discipline, if I'm honest, because we are, as you mentioned at the beginning, it's different how we run the cardiac arrest. The minute a patient goes into cardiac arrest, you'll find somebody running quick to do the cardio version to start CPR, and you really have to be calm and collected and make sure that you're well protected before you start. And kind of all the old practice has to come out of the window and you have to kind of be disciplined. So you get yourself protected and you start. And of course, this will have a major impact on the outcome. Because as I mentioned, the longer the patient in cardiac arrest, the less likely they'll recover. But it's important for the team to continue to be able to deliver uh, care without getting infected themselves. Can I just make a comment, if you don't mind? Yes, of course. Dr. This is Abu Bakr Khalil. Assalamu alaikum. Um, the idea of uh, staff protection has been already part of the ALS or ACLS protocol. So the first thing when a patient was found to be in kind of unconscious state, the first thing you check safety, right? You check if the place of arrest is safe. So if in the middle of the road, you're not going to start CPR, saving a few seconds to stay on the road to save that patient. You'll have to ensure you and the, and the patient are both safe. So it applies again. So if the patient is in a safe situation, you have to make sure the staff is also safe. Perhaps it will take time to take extra few seconds to get ready. But if staff members help one particular staff member to get ready and that particular staff member who's fully protected can start CPR, it may expedite the process, um, but otherwise you'll, you, you, can't, you can't expose staff for unnecessary high-risk infection. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Khalil. So, Dr. Hind, would you like to uh, show continue with this uh, presentation? Uh, just to recommend that the rest of the resuscitation will continue as usual, 
And, uh, and of course, after the resuscitation, the team should be aware how to dispose all this equipment. Okay, so, so the, uh, to continue with our case, so this patient uh, had one cycle of CPR and uh, one adrenaline and then regained ROSC, he was intubated. And post uh, intubation and uh, after ROSC, he got an, uh, an ECG. This is a 12 lead ECG. Great, so I'm gonna stop you there and I'll, I'll ask uh, Dr. Yogesh Raja, uh, interventional cardiologist from Sunderland Hospital. Uh, would you be able to comment on this ECG uh, for us, Dr. Raja? Yeah, thanks for having me here. Uh, it, the ECG clearly shows ST elevation in the inferior leads with some ST depression in B1 and B2. So it looks like a focal inferior ST elevation myocardial infarction. But what we know from data from the New York, when they've studied about 18 patients is even with focal inferior myocardial infarction, it's hard to know whether this is definitely a plaque rupture event or whether it could be focal myocarditis. So this is where we are right now. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Raja. And the next question, I guess, is what would you do about this, uh, this patient? How would you manage this? Yeah, this is where I think we are in unprecedented times. In a normal day, this patient would have definitely gone straight to the cat lab, as we all know. But now we are doing, dealing with things which we never thought we would ever deal with. So I think the important thing is, what do we do? Do we thrombolize here or do we take this patient for a primary PCI? And I think there is a lot of debate about what is best for these patients. I personally do think if there is ST elevation MI, primary PCI would be ideal in the situation because at least even if you take them to the cath lab, you will be able to get an angiogram done. But we know again that about 50% of the angiograms are actually normal in these situations. And therefore we have to be cautious. So who do we take? to the cath lab is personally, I think if you have a stay elevation MI, do an echocardiogram and look for any regional wall motion abnormalities. If there are regional wall motion abnormalities, then that at least is an indication that this patient can be taken to the cath lab. In this particular situation, because it's a cardiac arrest situation and there is focal in focal ST elevation MI, if the echo showed regional wall motion abnormalities, confined to the inferior wall, then I think there would be an indication for considering thrombolysis. It also depends on which center you're in, what the expertise for primary PCI in that center is. I think these are the things that we do need to take into consideration before we consider the right revascularization strategy for this particular patient. Okay, thank you very much. The other thing is again, when you're thinking of thrombolysis, you have to think of what medicine, what thrombolytic agent you would use. And I think fibrin specific agents are quite important. And I think something like tenecteplase would be an option in these situations. So I think it's always useful to have that in your center, tenecteplase, and also you have to follow it up with enoxaparin. But if you're able to do primary PCI, then I think that would be the best. Thank you, Dr. Roger. That was a very clear response, thank you. Um, can I ask some of the other uh, colleagues, interventional cardiologists, regarding what they would, uh, what their comments are? Hi, Yogesh. Hi, everybody. It's Abu Bakr again. Oh, sorry, Modesto, go ahead. No, no, it's okay. You go ahead. I'll, I'll follow you. Yeah, I, I don't know about uh, thrombolysis, uh, especially in a suspected um, myocarditis or peri my myopericarditis. Uh, those patients also have extra bleeding risk. I know they have got coagulopathies. Um, I think sometimes the easiest thing is to actually do an angiogram, and if it is normal, you can move on. Uh, depending again, it depends again in, on the setup of each hospital. Sometimes it's quicker to get a quick echo, uh, but I think a regional wall motion change may not change the outcome because in myocarditis, you could get similar regional wall motion changes, albeit maybe not as prominent. Um, I agree with Yogesh that 50% of those are uh, going to turn normal, but as we do, we still have to take the, precaution, uh, the precautions and protect ourselves and try to provide 
this still remain the standard uh, therapy, which is uh, primary PCI. That's just an opinion. Thank you, Dr. Khalil. Dr. Baik. Yes, <clears throat> I'll just uh, add on that, uh, yes, regional wall motion abnormalities can be taken as a, a particular myocardial infarction or focal infarction, but the problem is we do not have any previous echocardiograms on any of such patients to determine whether they had previous cardiac abnormalities. I know that ECG was normal, but uh, you could easily have a myocarditis as well as a focal plaque rupture and ST elevation MI. So there is no way to differentiate in a, somebody who is in 50s with otherwise fit and well and who's been to the ITU. I, I would prefer to take this patient to, to, the, to the lab and uh, look at the coronaries straight away without compromising uh, or taking a risk on coagulopathies and other issues because we have gone through a cardiac arrest situation. And I think uh, it's better not to waste time and go ahead and take the patient to the lab, obviously with full protection. Yeah. Dr. Mohanna, did you want to make a comment as well? Yes, I just sort of, God, there's a lot of echo here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, to my mind, if you think you need to treat this patient, it has to be taken to the lab under all the precautionary measures, i.e. full protection to everyone. Thrombolysis has really to be a last resort uh, to treat this, this kind of patient. We know that their outcome is 50% 50, 50 mortality if they are intubated and after cardiac arrest. But if you are going to do anything, um, it should be primary angioplasty. Um, and if the RT is normal, then be it, at least you know. Because the problem with the thrombolysis, we know it doesn't work all the time. So what happens if you give the thrombolysis and the ST does not resolve? You still got to have to take them to the lab in a much more complex uh, situation. Um, so I think, and as just mentioned previously, echo is very difficult to interpret in these conditions. You don't have a previous one. You could still have a focal um, uh, regional wall motion abnormality, even in the presence of myocarditis and normal arteries. Um, so, but it is a very, it has to be done on a patient by patient basis. Um, and primary angioplasty remains probably the cornerstone of treating these patients. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any comments? Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask the cardiologist about um, if I. Uh, Ahmed, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So, I mean, for somebody like this patient with this um, floor chest x ray that we've seen earlier, and he's got a background lung disease, we know from the experience now that by day five, is almost certain that the virus will still be there. Um, so the chances that he has cleared his airways within five days is remote. So would that weigh at all into your decisions about what to do in terms of intervention? Yes, I think that's a good question. Sorry, I mean, it is a difficult position, a difficult decision to take, to be honest, and it has to be done on a patient by patient basis. You have to think about the prognostic um, or the clinical situation of the patient themselves. Yes, this patient in his 50s, but if we look at the background with COPD and uh, chronic change in his lung and all, he might be 50 chronologically, but biologically he's probably much older. Um, and a PA arrest and cardiac arrest with COVID, and we know again that more, the survival rate is less than 50% when you have severe lung uh, uh, effect from the COVID. Um, it is difficult, but um, if you have a full protected team, which we usually do, and that's what we, it, um, it's probably okay to take him to the lab and look uh, into his coronary arteries. But it is sometimes, if you have an elderly patient who has multiple comorbidities and you know their prognosis is not very good, sometimes just medical treatment and conservative treatment may be the option. Great. Thank you. Uh, one more important thing, Ahmed and the group. Uh, repeating the ECG obviously within a few seconds as you're getting ready to go to the cath lab is always helpful because often these are actually coronary spasm and they may settle. So dynamic changes are important. And so once off ECG, yes, it does activate the cath lab, but it should be repeated as frequent as possible uh, because it may change uh, the decision making. Thank you very much. So I think, I think uh, unless there's anybody else wants to comment, I think we, we're all... Uh, here in the same message really is that in this in this sort of situation an echo is very useful but also you should consider prime PCI 
as a first line treatment and that echoes the uh, British Cardiovascular Society uh, um, guidance on the management of uh, ST elevation MI in the context of COVID. Um, Dr. Hind, could you, uh, would you like to continue? We can't uh, quite hear you at the moment. Uh, I was muted, but now I'm not muted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, yes. Okay. Would you like to tell us what happened to this patient? So, now, back to our patient. So, obviously, uh, as we could see from the ECG, this patient had inferior STEMI and uh, actually discussed for primary PCI with the tertiary centre and the advice was to treat this patient medically. So accordingly, the decision was made to thrombolize this patient and received alteplase in addition to the rest of the ACS medication. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Hin. So I think the, the, the other consideration that perhaps we didn't discuss was uh, where the patient is. So if, if the patient is already in a tertiary center, uh, that may make it more easily available to, uh, whereas if the patient is in a, a district general hospital, then you have issues regarding uh, transfer. Does anyone want to comment about that? I think that's very important, I can. That was one of the reasons why I do think in this present era, you will need to know how to thrombolize these patients. Because in most district general hospitals, they've forgotten how to even thrombolize patients nowadays because they all go to a primary PCI lab and end up getting primary PCI. And that was the question I was worried about in this particular patient. If you had focal inferior ST elevation, lot of comorbidities, it takes another half an hour, 45 minutes to go to your nearest center. What are you going to do to help the patient at that particular stage? And I think in those situations are the only times I think that thrombolysis would be indicated. And like I told you, the New York data was quite useful in that I was quite surprised myself because what it showed is when you had regional wall mo motion abnormalities, then the chance of finding occlusive coronary artery disease was high. And most all the patients who had actually occluded coronary artery disease actually had regional wall motion abnormalities. And the ones with myocarditis did not have significant regional wall motion abnormalities in that particular study, but it's a very small case series of about 18 patients. And therefore it's hard to just go based on that data. But I think with time, we learn more about it. And I suspect this particular situation, thrombolysis was the only option over here, basically. But if it wasn't a tertiary center, I would definitely say go for primary PCI and at least get an angio done, because then at least it's much more safer in this situation. Do you think if this was in your center, would you take him to the lab? Or would yes. you say, do you recommend medical treatment as the tertiary center? There's no doubt we would take him to the lab in our center. So you think where the patient is could make a difference? That I don't know. The young patient, it depends on how long the patient was down. If the downtime was about 10, 15 minutes, then it's okay. So we have criteria, we go based on the cardiac arrest criteria. We look at the pH, if the pH is less than seven, 6.9, the lactate is very high, multiple comorbidities, the, it's about 20 to 30 minutes of downtime then clearly I think we need to make a decision at that stage and decide whether it's reasonable to go to a lab in someone with so many comorbidities. We do have a very low threshold to take patients to our cath lab in Sunderland because anyone who has a cardiac arrest, we normally generally take them to the, especially if it's VTVF, we generally take them to the cath lab. And even if they have a stay elevation post arrest, we generally take them to the lab and at least have a look because it's useful to at least have a look and know what's going on basically. In this particular situation, I would look at all the other indications, like I said earlier, the pH, the lactate, the downtime, the comorbidities. And once we've gone through all this and we think it's reasonable, then the patient would have been taken to a cath lab. I suppose uh, the, the main reason that will deter you from not taking the patient to the cath lab from a DGH would be a, a longer transfer, a standard time for people as we all know, is 90 minutes. Um, probably could accept up to 120 minutes sometimes in these situations. Remember, this patient has just had a lot of CPR probably and had fractured ribs. And actually, the risk of thrombolysis increases significantly uh, in these situations. I, I still feel, unless there is 
compelling reason not to take the patient to a primary PCI center, um, it should be highly considered and thrombolysis should be uh, way down the, uh, the, the options, I think. Just a comment that if we are managing this patient with medical treatment and the aim is to thrombolyze as per suggestion from the tertiary center, uh, I would believe that we would follow the same protocol of thrombolysis and ST elevation resolution and all that. So we need to be clear here that if you're thrombolizing this patient uh, based on timing uh, or transfer to the another hospital, then we need to be clear that if there is no ST resolution, uh, then what will be the next step? Because now you have got a patient who has been thrombolized uh, with a, a situation when he's uh, COVID positive and uh, he's recently been to ITU care uh, with a significant comorbid state. Now taking this patient uh, for the primary PCI after a failed thrombolysis, I think that will be uh, a bit more of a risk than taking the patient directly to the lab. Well, Mudassa, that was my, my point that I made a little earlier. This is why I think thrombolysis, if you make the decision to treat, you have to take them to the lab. Thrombolysis should be last because what do you do if the thrombolysis doesn't, doesn't work? And we know it only works in about 60, 65%. So that is an important point because it becomes much more messy and much more difficult to treat and with more complications. Uh, would, would you, Mohanad, hi, Mohanad, salam yeah, yeah, would you uh, accept slightly longer time um, than the standard 90 minutes uh, in these cases? Um, yes, but uh, the reason I asked the question before, if you, whether the treatment changes, I'm thinking, even if you were in the tertiary center, I think the decision would still be the same. Just because of five days on ITU with a significant amount of disease in his lungs and we know the prognostic benefit and it is inferior, so I wouldn't be prognostically, it might not be as, as important. Um, but of course, every case is different and every decision has to be made at the time. And it's easy to be in hindsight to say this, this and that, but this is a patient chronologically 50, but biologically much, much older with COVID and aggressive COVID, what it looks like, particularly on his CT and chest X-ray. Um, so his prognostic or prognosis might not be as good. Thank you, Dr. Mohanad. Um, th there was another issue that I wanted to uh, raise in this case is that um, this, this patient was uh, presented during the early st stages of the uh, pandemic. And it raises the question is, is your cath lab ready to manage a COVID patient? Because certainly when, when we, uh, at Withenshaw, when the pandemic was, was uh, announced, we weren't ready to take these patients straight away. And we had to make a lot of efforts to get the cath lab I, staff and uh, everything ready in order to-, yeah. to accept I think that's, you raised a very, very important point, not only being ready, because we are ready right now, we all have learned how to do it. I think the fear factor has changed. There's no question in my mind how we were behaving at the beginning of the pandemic and the fear factor in a lot of doctors, rightly so, has, made, has influenced our decisions how to treat and what to treat. Now that we've dealt with this for about four, six weeks, and we kind of got used to how we handle most of this, the decision may be a little different. Now, that doesn't mean if you have somebody with comorbidity and uh, advanced COVID disease in their lungs and they've been in ITU for a long time, that you still take that into account. But certainly our approach to these patients has changed because the fear factor is a little less it's still present, but we, we learned how to deal with, with our preparation, how to be ready, and um, we got a little bit better in, in that respect. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Hind. So, uh, Dr. Hind, would you like to continue? Just to comment, the tertiary center is 20 minutes um, away from the uh, district hospital where that patient was admitted. Um, so, we'll continue. Uh, the next, what happened with this patient. So this is just a slide about the indication of thrombolysis uh, uh, and STEMI. Uh, the, just briefly, uh, of course, the uh, indication uh, if the patient has a, a STEMI, uh, 
preferably within 12 hours, uh, and there's no facility of um, a primary PCI, uh, or the, the primary PCI center is um, uh, quite far from the um, uh, base hospital. Um, if there's no contraindications, I will come to the to that in a uh, in a minute. And um, for COVID patients, as uh, has been discussed um, uh, earlier, and the actually the magnitude of the reduction in the risk of uh, death uh, in randomized trials in a patient with a STEMI who had a thrombolysis is generally between 15 to 30. And uh, the benefit generally uh, declines rapidly at the time from the onset of symptom uh, uh, is incre increases. Uh, as I said, um, 12 hours um, is um, uh, the cutoff. Um, whether it could be extended up to 15 hours, that is uh, possible depending on the condition of the patient. So uh, the absolute contraindication, uh, as we all know, and I'll just go briefly um, uh, through them. Um, if the absolute contraindication include any history of intracranial hemorrhage, uh, as we all know, uh, any history of ischemic stroke within three months and a uh, history of neoplasm or neoplasm or structural, structural cerebral vascular lesions such as uh, arterial venous malformation, and of course, uh, suspected aortic dissection, those patients should not receive uh, thrombolysis. And uh, if there's any evidence of active bleeding, uh, and uh, of course, if there's any closed head or face trauma in the last three months. The relative contraindication uh, include those with severe hypertension with a systolic blood pressure of 180 uh, and a diastolic of more, of, of uh, systolic blood pressure of more than 180 or a diastolic of more than 110, uh, any history of ischemic stroke, uh, a major trauma in the past two to, five, uh, two to four weeks, and uh, a non-compressible vascular puncture pregnancy is a relative contraindication. And if there is any active peptic ulcer or the, also the uh, uh, use of anticoagulation. So this is the uh, patient 12 ECG, one hour post thrombolysis. Do you want to comment on that? Um, or shall I just uh, carry on? So I think, um, I think if someone would like to comment on that uh, ECG because we did talk about the issue of well, if, you, if you go down the route of thrombolysis uh, and, and, and so, if someone would like to talk about this, please. So how, 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 long, how long after the thrombolysis was this? This is one this hour. Is post one hour. Uh, I just put the previous uh, ECG uh, prior to thrombolysis at the uh, bottom, so you can compare. Um, as you can see, there is no much difference. Uh, if anything, uh, it might be an increase in the acceleration, actually. So, would like someone like to comment on that? Uh... Yeah, I mean, as described, I mean, no difference. Maybe slightly more prominent and you could see now in v6 is a lot bit more prominent okay uh, i'd like to continue dr hind okay so this is this is the eight hours uh, 12 easy cg as we can see there is a complete uh, almost complete resolution still there is some minimal ST elevation in lead to an avf but obviously okay, so you just stop still... there if i could stop you there and just ask um for my colleagues to comment on this because Certainly, a, the one-hour ECG, uh, it 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 looked like there was residual uh, ST elevation. But uh, would someone like to comment on this ECG? Well, it's very unusual uh, to uh, uh, not to take the patient to the cath lab if he had persistent ST elevation one hour after thrombolysis uh, and waiting for eight hours. I don't know what has happened in that uh, in that gap. Well, can I? I mean. We did see this in the thrombolysis era, sometimes up to two to three hours, and we had that frequently. I think we kind of presented an abstract on this. Um, it is expected to be quicker within 60 minutes, but we did see changes later. The surprise or the interesting thing here, there's no Q-wave inferiorly. So that makes you think this is probably all might have been related to severe spasm or 
um, and I'd be interested to see if this man has gone to the cath lab and had an angiogram because his ECG now is back to normal. Yeah. Which is unusual, very unusual, isn't it? Yeah, so, I, I uh, think this is going to be COVID related, but uh, we'll see. Although, in a man of his age with his history, smoking and all what he has background, you wouldn't be surprised if there's coronary artery disease. But the fact that this is um, showing, I mean, normal ECG with no Q wave after all this um, and the time frame is probably unlikely to be an MI. The other question is was there an ECG done about a couple of hours after the procedure? What happened? Because that's what's important here, because sometimes, you know, when we were thrombolizing patients in that era, you used to have sometimes late pa patients who tend to reperfuse a bit more later, close to yeah, the 120 this, minutes. This is what I said. I mean, the, we presented this abstract in, in ESC some time ago. Mm. Up to three to four hours, you saw the changes of some people exactly. when we didn't have immediate, immediate access to the cath lab. So do you it's have an actually... ECD about 90 minutes or 120 minutes post? Yes, there is an ECG actually at two hours for thrombolysis, but there was no difference actually, and that's why I uh, uh, did not include it, but I have it, I might show it later. Uh, it wasn't, the ST elevation is still there, it's almost similar to um, uh, the one hour. So, and do you have, what's the interval between the ECGs? Do you have one at three hours, four hours? It's only two hours and eight hours. I have two hours, yeah, and the one hour, two hours, and uh, the eight hours. Right, okay. Because it'd be interesting to see when that's changed. And the only other thing is whether we did an echocardiogram at any point on this patient. Yeah, the thing that this patient did not have an echocardiogram, um, uh, which is uh, possibly um, because of his... Um, uh, the decision. If you, if I uh, move to the next uh, slide, this is just an X-ray, um, and uh, it has not it has not shown any changes. The actually the next was the discussion of DNR CPR for this patient, and he was deemed for not resuscitation, and that's the reason I think the there was no an echo for that because it wouldn't have made any change in the management of this patient. So that's the reason I think um, there was no uh, um, a subsequent uh, transrestic echocardiogram. Okay, thank you. But there was no, no echo for this patient. I, I think just a comment that it's, it is very interesting to, to make a decision now. Somebody who had uh, some degree of comorbid state and was a candidate for ITU, uh, and then now he has an arrest, and we got the ROSC and everything else. Uh, and you have thrombolysed even the patient, uh, and now the patient is not for escalation of therapy, which is a bit surprising, uh, just because we have had a PA arrest. Uh, yes, it makes a change, but you have still fixed, uh, apparently fixed uh, the ST elevation as well. Yeah, that was the discussion with the team. This is the ITU, um, a team uh, with probably the cardiologist in the, in the, in the hospital. That was uh, the decision which was made by the, the, the involved teams in this, for this patient. So, Madassa, do you think this is the wrong decision? No, no, no I'm saying I'm, I'm, I'm just in, intrigued by the decision making here because now you have done everything that you could do. You have intubated the patient, patient has survived the arrest, and now you have decided not to escalate. I means patient is intubated, ventilated, and you still not waited for 24 hours to see the response. I agree, uh, but that was, uh, I think, after um, um, uh, quite a discussion, uh, extensive discussion with the teams, um, and that, that was a decision, and it was uh, almost done uh, maybe late in that same day. So I think at this at this stage, I mean, I think absolutely, it's a, it's it's a, it's an int very interesting case, and and certainly if we remember, this is the early stages of the COVID pandemic. The experience was was quite little at that time, and I know obviously it's 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 a lot easier when you're when you're part of the intensive care team yourself. You'll be managing the patient. You you're often in in a, in a good good position to to know what uh, what uh, the the situation is. But however, you're absolutely right, Doctor Big. And at this point, um, I, I would like to um, in, invite Doctor Diane uh, Monkhouse and welcome her to the uh, to the webinar. Uh, she's okay. a consultant in intensive care. 
at uh, the James Cook Hospital in Middlesbrough. And I don't know whether you've been uh, following the case, Dr. Um, Monkhouse. But, I've um, just joined midway through, so I may have missed some of the detail. OK, so just as a summary, uh, it's a 50 year old man, background of hypertension and ex-smoker and COPD, presented in an atypical, but now we think it's, it's becoming typical uh, way for COVID. They had abdominal pain, uh, worsening of their cough, and they were hy extremely hypoxic on admission with type 1 respiratory failure. They spent a couple of days in HDU, managed with CPAP. Um, and then they were transferred down to the, or stepped down to the respiratory ward, where on the, on the way back from the, the bathroom, they had a, um, a PEA cardiac arrest. They were resuscitated after one cycle of CPR um, and uh, one adrenaline. And at that stage, the ECG demonstrated inferior uh, ST elevation, um, which, which was typical for an inferior STEMI. It was discussed at the tertiary centre and it was deemed uh, the decision was made for thrombolysis. Uh, one, uh, one or two hours after thrombolysis, there was still no resolution. However, remarkably, eight hours afterwards, there was complete normalization of the ECG. And now this patient is intubated, ventilated in intensive care. Um, the East, the, the, uh, they had a CT abdomen early on uh, in, uh, to investigate their abdominal pain. It didn't show anything acute, but it picked up some extensive changes within the, within the chest. Uh, ground glass opacities and consolidation, which was consistent, very typical for COVID. So now this, the scenario is the patient is now intubated in, uh, and ventilated in ITU and um, a decision has been made following discussion with the family regarding uh, and the patient was, was put for DNAR. Okay, so I, I gather that people had concerns about the decision for uh, not for resuscitation. Um, I think if you're in an intensive care situation, receiving multi-organ support and get to the point of um, requiring resuscitation, then your outlook is extremely uh, poor anyway. However, um, for an acute reversible shockable rhythm, I would have been tempted to embark upon um, uh, some electrical therapy to try and reverse that situation in the acute phase. However, I think with um, ongoing multi-organ support um, with evidence of acute deterioration, then outlook obviously is, is quite poor. So it's not to criticise the team making that decision. Um, I suspect it was based on the information that they had at that time. Um, but I can understand why there may be a reticence to offer resuscitation. However, this is not and uh, it's not stopping treatment, it's continuing active multi-organ support, which is the important thing that this, this patient needs. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody have any other comments at all? Do we know the outcome of this patient at the end? So yes, Dr. Hind, would you like to continue? Uh, you're just on mute. So, Thanks. all right, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So, um, right, the, as I showed earlier, this is just the next day ECG, as you can see, it's just similar to the previous one. And uh, so, um, so on day six, this patient was extubated and remained in HDU for two days. Uh, on face mask maintaining saturation uh, more than 88% and 45% FIO. Uh, he developed hypoactive delirium and he also suffered from abdominal pain and managed with analgesia. Uh, initially had a feeding via NG tube. Uh, this is just his trop, as we can see was 3000, more than 3000. Recalcitonin was elevated as well. Then on day nine, this patient was transferred to CCU, but he remained unwell, a bit responsive, uh, requiring uh, oxygen. Uh, he developed an AKI as well, and uh, remained uh, clinically fluctuating, uh, but generally um, uh, responsive, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, and uh, on day 13, uh, he started uh, to develop uh, again, abdominal 
pain and uh, he passed also loose motion several times. The team decided to go for CT abdomen. And this is his CT abdomen. As we can see, uh, there is an obvious, um, as reported uh, in the uh, CT abdomen, the pelvis report, there is a perforation and uh, they described a visceral per per perforation, most likely secondary to ascending clonic uh, diverticular perforation. And uh, of course was declined by the general surgery team or any further intervention. So uh, on day 14, uh, this patient uh, continued to uh, worsen clinically until, until he eventually succumbed and rested in peace. And uh, with that, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Hind. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a sad case, unfortunately. Um, regarding the perforation, does anyone have any comments regarding, you know, this, this, is this related to COVID? Is it, does, it, does the thrombolysis have any effect? Um, the patient was on dexamethasone. They were randomized early on. Um, does anyone like to to uh, to discuss some of these issues? It's difficult to know the pathology or the etiology behind this. It may well be related to COVID because we know it does cause microvascular thrombosis and small vessel thrombosis. And uh, um, sometimes even thrombolysis itself, if you don't continue with heparin, you have a reactive um, uh, increased thrombosis. Um, it could be his low blood pressure. He had a, an acute kidney injury, which also again may be related to low blood pressure to multiple um, factors in his case. So um, it's difficult to know the etiology, but it's probably ischemic bowel related to low blood pressure, maybe ischemic occlusion of some arteries. Dr. Taha, would, would you yeah, I, I fully I fully agree with Mohammed. It's, it's, it's impossible to know, um, especially it's one thing, as you said, maybe steroids have um, um, contributed to that as well, that he, as part of his recovery, um, 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 intervention. Um, I mean, if I have to say a general comment, of all aspects of COVID-19 that we know so far, whether it's clinical manifestations or, um, you know, diagnostics or biologic or epidemiologic, maybe the weakest link um, of all our knowledge now is the pathogenesis. What determines disease, you know, infection, infection and disease, infection, disease and death. Um, this is the weakest um, part of our knowledge now. And clearly, if we don't have very good handle on causes this, um, we will continue to shoot in the dark. And you can see from the um, list of the interventions that were there in the every trial, we're trying to find a um, one side that fits all. And clearly that is not possible because there's no one side that fits all. And until we have got better knowledge, we will continue to try and virals, clonals, convalescence, you know, sera, um, and try to, to find some, some solutions. But definitely we don't know a lot. Um, and this um, coagulopathy or thrombotic risk that comes with COVID-19 wasn't really prominent in the first report that came out of China at the beginning. You know, gradually, um, you know, you notice that and became now like unequivocally proven. Um, and maybe, uh, you know, of big interest to the people who are in this um, meeting, the specific increased risk of um, coagulopathy um, in, um, you know, certain, um, uh, you know, or ethnic groups. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of things that we need to know explain the phenotype of disease um, um, and you know, next few weeks maybe or months we will learn more. Thank you Dr. Taha. Um, Dr. Monkhouse, do you have any comments about this sort of uh, about the, 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 the presentation and the, the perforation and I, I, I agree that at the moment it's speculative just based on the case history. It would be nice to have a post-mortem examination to fully identify that, but hypoxia, hypoperfusion, microthrombosis, all of those uh, could 
or combinations of them could have affected the bowel. It's difficult to speculate, I would say. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any views as, as to whether any particular interventions we could have done could have changed the outcome of the, for this patient? My, my feeling certainly is that I, I, I don't, I'm not sure really that any intervention that we would have done would have necessarily changed the outcome for this uh, this patient. Um, perhaps perhaps if he hadn't uh, had thrombolysis, then he may not have. Um, may perhaps the thrombolysis you know precipitated the, uh, the, the the final demise. But I'm not sure whether that's necessarily true. I'll tell you one thing, uh, Ahmed. Um, as far as COVID-19 is concerned, we have no single intervention that's proven to change anything, you know, individually. Full stop. As far as COVID is concerned. But yeah, of course, the treatment for his cardiovascular problem or the decisions about his, you know, uh, resource or, or surgery, these are different things. But um, as far as the driving force behind it, the COVID-19, there is no specific thing that's proven, not to this patient, but to anyone else. We don't know. But if we know, you know, everything would change. Uh, I think the patient is very unfortunate to have this cascade of uh, complications one after another. Um, I don't think the outcome would have been different with any intervention, as you mentioned. Um, but um, personally, if I was in that situation, I would first of all would not recommend thrombolysis. Uh, if the blood pressure allows, I will keep the patient or start the patient on uh, IV nitrates until taken to the cath lab, just in case if this is. Uh, a spasm it may help to resolve it um, and then other complications obviously are unrelated uh, but it's just unfortunate situation yeah. certainly dr well, i think the, the, the last point i wanted to make really was regarding echocardiography because um from a cardiology perspective it, it can change your management of, of patients and having availability of echocardiography in patients with covid is, is a very important issue and the British Society of Echocardiography have released uh, guidelines about how you should perform those uh, bed, uh, those echocardiography scans in a sort of bedside manner, um, using portable um, echocardiography, wearing appropriate PPE, and limiting the, the studies to a very focused uh, level one type of uh, scans and pictures, and then to ensure that you analyze the the um, the, the the images at a later stage. So collect the, the images and analyze at a later stage. Um, at this